DLC gets a bad rep. So often we see it associated with greedy corporate practices, the dreaded M word. It can be easy to forget just how special DLC can be. For the longest time, expansion packs were reserved for board games and PC gamers. For humble console gamers like myself, adding more to the games that we loved just wasn't on the cards, no matter how much we wished otherwise. In 2010, I had just completed Tomb Raider Underworld for the second time, and I was kinda sad. I had found every secret, unlocked every outfit, and earned every achievement. There was nothing more for me to discover. I mentioned this to a co-worker, who then handed me a gaming magazine and said, well, what about that? It was an article on Beneath the Ashes, the first expansion for Tomb Raider Underworld. To say that my mind was blown that day would not do justice to the sense of wonder and possibility I felt in that moment. I had no interest in online gaming, so I had never bothered with Xbox Live. That day when I got home, I made an account, and discovered not one, but two expansions for my favourite British explorer. My finances took a bit of a hit over the following weeks, as I also dove into the extra content for Resident Evil 5, and Mass Effect, and I had zero regrets. As far as I was concerned, the internet had finally proven its worth. A piece of DLC can be every bit as extraordinary as a full price AAA game. At the same time, DLC is afforded some unique opportunities because of its format, and these are the topics I would like to discuss in this video. With all of that in mind, there will be some spoilers throughout, so please use the skips down below if I mention a game that you don't want to spoil. Let's get started. In my eyes, an extended universe DLC is one of two things. When a story is told in the same universe as the base game, or when the mechanics of the base game are used to tell a different story. The great thing about extending a game's universe is the near limitless potential for just how wacky you can go with it. A very recent example of this is the Night Springs DLC for Alan Wake 2. The number one fan story, in particular, is a hilarious take on fan fictions. It could not be more different in tone than the main campaign, and yet it fits so perfectly within the universe. Thanks to a fun premise and some solid writing, plus a banger of a soundtrack, I loved every second of it. What do you got? I have a shotgun! Well, I got a... Wait, is that... That's a real shotgun? Okay, I admit that's a... I didn't expect that. Then there was the time Assassin's Creed 3 showed us an alternate universe where George Washington went mad with power, and Connor was able to transform into animals. I know that one is technically canon, but because we shifted to an alternate reality, I'm gonna say it's allowed. At one time, it was a really popular move to pit your heroes against zombies, and I had a lot of fun with Cold Darkness, Rise of the Tomb Raider's puzzle and action-heavy take on this. I can't say I was particularly thrilled when Far Cry 5 did it though. The Far Cry series regularly puts out DLC that qualifies as extended universe content. Whether it's going back to Vietnam, forward to Mars, or inside the mind of series villains, they all unfortunately end up feeling a bit flat. They never really add anything new beyond the setting. The DLC for Far Cry 6 in particular left a very sour taste, when it forced you to start all your quest progress over again if you had to quit out. The real shame though, is when you remember that the first time Far Cry ever tried this, they created an experience that was quite simply magnificent. I am talking, of course, about Blood Dragon, a standalone adventure inspired by the very best and worst of 80s retro-futuristic action movies. The pop culture references were everywhere. Even switching and reloading your weapons was a sight to behold. And to top it all off, your cyborg commando hero was voiced by Michael Bean. That's right, folks, Kyle Reese slash Corporal Hicks himself, a quintessential 80s hero. Blood Dragon did fall victim to all of the usual failings of the Far Cry series, 
but it was made with so much passion and charm that it didn't matter. For everything that didn't work, there were 10 things that did. And that, my friends, is a true mark of a project completed out of love, rather than just to hit a deadline. So this category is a little more controversial. A lot of people have always argued that paying full price for a game should get you access to the full game, and that the true ending of a game should not be locked behind a DLC paywall. There have been some DLC packages that were very obviously cut content held back to make more money. The Day One DLC for Mass Effect 3, From Ashes, being one such blatantly obvious example. However, most additional narrative content will take the form of an epilogue, so that you don't technically take anything away from the campaign story. My very first examples for Tomb Raider Underworld, Beneath the Ashes and Lara's Shadow, did exactly this. More recently, I played through and thoroughly enjoyed Shadows of Rose, the expansion for Resident Evil Village, and it did the exact same thing. In both of these examples, I would argue a large part of what they are was shaped by fan feedback. In both cases, the campaign endings were a bit abrupt, with lingering questions, and in the case of Resident Evil, a substantial time skip and new character to consider. Also in both cases, the expansions provided some much needed closure to the stories. They also clearly had a lot of fun experimenting with new gameplay mechanics. In Lara's Shadow, you take on the role of her superpowered doppelganger. Now Lara Croft is no slouch in the badass department, but her shadow can hit supernatural monsters so hard that they explode. Kill. Shadows of Rose is, in my opinion, significantly more frightening than the Village campaign. If you thought the giant baby was bad, you ain't seen nothing yet. Rose starts out much more intrepid than Ethan did, but she also develops her powers along the way, and by the end she can basically see the Matrix. In both of these cases, the elements shaped by fan feedback would not have been possible to predict prior to the game's releases. I've been in my share of project meetings, and I know all too well that until your work is public facing, you exist in a vacuum. Both cases also feature completely new gameplay mechanics. When you're working towards a deadline with a set budget, assigning team members to develop something like this would just be irresponsible. It's a very fine line to skirt, existing between an epilogue and what can be considered a true ending, but it's probably the best approach one can take without damaging the campaign story. To put my logic to the test, I replayed Burial at Sea, the two-part DLC for Bioshock Infinite. You all know the Bioshock plot twist. Would You Kindly is one of the most iconic moments in all of gaming. And if you have played Burial at Sea, you know that this was facilitated by Elizabeth, sacrificing her omniscient multiverse powers and closing the loop on Rapture and Columbia. In my opinion, Burial at Sea is an absolutely essential part of the Bioshock experience. But to really put myself on the spot, if I hadn't played Burial at Sea, would I have enjoyed Bioshock Infinite or indeed Bioshock 1 any less? Technically, no. I would have still loved them. We've already covered how DLC needs to offer something new to make it worth our time. Sometimes this will take the form of a new area to explore, with new characters, new quests, new loot, new abilities, and any combination thereof. A recent and fantastic example is the Burning Shores expansion for Horizon Forbidden West. It takes all of the boxes we have just listed, whilst largely playing the same as the base game, which in cases like this is totally fine. The expansion adds more than enough new things for Aloy to see and do. This sort of expansion model is very popular, especially among open world titles. Then you have the likes of Separate Ways, the expansion for the Resident Evil 4 remake. It tells the story of Ada, the ninja spy who operates behind the scenes of Leon's adventure. Don't worry, Leon. First time's free. Ada plays largely the same as Leon, except she sometimes busts out her detective vision and a couple of unique weapons. 
The thing that really makes Separate Ways stand on its own, though, is Ada's grappling hook. You see, it doesn't just add verticality to the levels and let Ada zip around in ways that Leon can't. It also disarms enemy shields during combat, and Spider-Man's used straight over to stun enemies who just need to be kicked in the face. On one notable occasion, it puts an extremely cool spin on what would have otherwise been a repeated boss fight, quite literally in fact. It seems like such a small addition, but this one item makes for a seriously brilliant new experience. Another style of content that crops up from time to time in DLC is some kind of horde mode. A wave defense game, with levels that increase in challenge the longer you survive. Whilst you will mostly see this in online shooters, easily my favorite example from recent years is the Mr. X DLC for Streets of Rage 4. The combat was already flawless. So now, the player is rewarded at the end of each round with RNG buffs, like increased speed and adding elements to their attacks. The end result is absolute carnage, and it's a little scary just how addictive it can be. In each of these cases, there is usually something you can take from the DLC back into the campaign. New weapons or gear is the standard, and in Streets of Rage, you can spend your high score points on new moves, and some of them are absolute game changers. At its core, the Streets of Rage 4 DLC is about presenting the player with new challenges, and this segues nicely into my next heading. It stands to reason that players who overcome the challenges of the main game need new challenges to keep them interested. Depending on the type of game, this can mean anything from just including something different to continually finding new ways to push the player. And out of everything we have discussed today, it is perhaps the most difficult one to get right. A key reason for this is the line between increasing challenge and inflating difficulty, which is something that a lot of developers struggle to get right. The Doom Eternal DLC, The Ancient Gods, is an unfortunately very poor example of this. I thought the Doom Eternal campaign was pretty much flawless, expertly balancing all of the challenges thrown your way, and it never once felt like work to me. The DLC included situational armor for already difficult enemies, and rear echelon bad guys who buff the front lines. These additions tipped that balance, and made the game feel like work. I'm not averse to gimmicks when used correctly, but here they were just a thing to tick off a list before I could get to the actual fun whereas the campaign gave me freedom to tackle the horde of enemies in whatever order I chose, and it was a shame to see that freedom lost. A gimmick for me is something that makes a seemingly impossible challenge suddenly become possible, like most of the bosses in Demon's Souls, or more recently, the fire golems in Shadow of the Erd Tree. Those rascals behind the Soulsborne games sure do know how to strike that tough but fair balance most of the time. The Bloodborne DLC, The Old Hunters, puts you on the back foot straight away. The opening area contains some of the titular Old Hunters, and they will shred you if you give them half a second to do so. But just like in the base game, you can wait for your moment, strike back, and win. The bosses were more ferocious than ever, but like in the base game, you could figure out their patterns, strike back, and win. The Dark Souls 3 DLC did the same thing again. I will never forget the opening area of the Ashes of Ariandel, the seemingly standard group of mobs who worked a little bit too well as a team for my liking really made me work to get past them. My reward for finally getting past these guys was like 30 wolves and some trees that loved me too much. <laughs> But again, it was all new challenges for me to figure out, overcome, and be rewarded for. And it worked. I'd like to wind this video down by covering one of my favorite pieces of DLC of all time, Lair of the Shadow Broker for Mass Effect 2. 
The Shadow Broker has been in power for decades. He's stronger than anything you've ever faced. Everything we have discussed today is checked off in this one piece of content. It is both a side adventure and an addition to the main narrative. You have new areas to explore, new enemy types to face, a couple of new gameplay sections, and the detective section, and two new bosses to face, both of whom have new gimmicks to learn and are much more challenging than anything you will face in the base game. Once the DLC is concluded, you have a new hub area, with helpful new features like respecking your squad mates, and plenty of easter eggs for you to find, my favourite of which is your squad mates browser histories. Lair of the Shadow Broker is one of the best examples of expansion content I have ever seen, and all these years later, there is only one other piece of DLC that I have ever considered to be better. If you know, you know. Best times in my life were spent on that ship. Been a damn good ride. <laughs> the best. Now tell me, my friends, what are some of your favourite pieces of DLC, and what was it that made them so special for you? I feel I should mention that I haven't played The Witcher 3 yet, and that's why you didn't see Blood and Wine mentioned here. I hope you enjoyed our talk on DLC today. Thank you as always for watching, and for supporting my channel, you guys. I cannot believe we are past 3,000 subscribers now. See you on the next one.